If you're a regular listener, you've heard Joe and Al talk about leverage a number of times lately. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth, you might be surprised to hear how you can use leverage to reduce your risk and increase your returns. Plus, the fellas answer your money questions. Is cash flow possible when investing in real estate in San Diego? Can you buy a house in the Philippines, pay for it with 401k money, and not pay any tax? Do you have to take RMDs from your Roth IRA? When is the best time to take RMDs? And finally, Joe Anderson CFP and Big Al Clopine CPA talk tariffs and the inverted yield curve and important stuff like beer and friends. But first, Big Al Clopine is joined by financial mentor Todd Tresseter, author of the new book, The Leverage Equation, How to Work Less, Make More, and Cut 30 Years Off Your Retirement Plan. Todd, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show, Alan. I'm really excited to talk to you because you have just written a book called The Leverage Equation. And it's a topic that very few people have ever written about. And I think it's actually one of the more important topics out there for those that would like to build real wealth. So maybe let's start with what caused you to write the book. Yeah, it it stemmed from a course I wrote, Expectancy Wealth Planning, where I, I teach wealth planning a very different way. I teach it from the ground up, the foundation of wealth, which is two equations. And gee, great way to start an interview with math equations, right? Yeah, but, right. <laughs> you know, this is the foundation of wealth, right? And so, and I'm not going to get fancy math. It's just to get the principles. You know, you, your wealth grows based on math. I mean, that's just the financial reality. And it's uh, the expectancy equation, mathematical expectancy, which determines your growth rate. And then the future value equation, which is the growth rate times time, right? And so, When I teach wealth, I help people understand that foundation that expectancy is very counterintuitive because it's probability times payoff. Everybody gets probability, but they don't understand what happens to wealth growth when you introduce the payoff equation. And so where leverage comes in, leverage takes one component of that payoff equation, which is the big wins component, and it matches it up against the other side of the payoff equation, which is controlling losses. And this is absolutely key to growing your wealth. For anybody that cares about financial freedom, they want you know, a secure retirement, any of these issues, if this is important to you, then this equation is important because you have to understand how payoff affects your wealth growth. You can't lose big. You've got to control the losses and you have to play for the big wins. That means scalable, leverageable wealth plans. Yeah, and I think, and I want to get specific here in a second, but um, but maybe just kind of top level leverage. Uh, what you're talking about, I mean, obviously there's financial leverage, meaning that you borrow money yeah. to do investments, but leverage is much deeper than that. Well, it's a really important point you're bringing up because everybody thinks they get leverage, right? They they understand one type of leverage sort of a little bit intuitively, which is financial leverage, and financial leverage is unique because it's the one type of leverage that cuts both ways. It both increases risk and it increases return. And so, but that's the only one. There's six types of leverage and the other five do not increase risk. As a matter of fact, you can reduce risk while increasing return. So the other ones include time leverage, networking leverage, um, communications leverage, systems leverage, knowledge leverage, all these different types of leverage you can employ in your wealth growth so you're accessing resources that go beyond your own. See, the problem with wealth growth is you're limited by your own resources if you don't apply leverage. What leverage allows you to do, and this is very important, is it allows you to get beyond your own limitations of your own resources. And what that does is that allows you to get the return equity, the return on equity equation, which is part of your growth, is not limited by your own resources as well as you're not limited by your own time. And so you're not, now your income is no longer connected to your time. And so these are very, very important principles that very few people understand, and that's why I wanted to write the book. Yeah, and I, I learned that. I go way back to my late 20s when I started the CPA firm, and I was preparing tax returns and making a decent income. But the only way to make more income was to work harder. And, and when you're a tax accountant, then tax season is just unbearable. And then it's like, gosh, this, this doesn't seem like it's good for my health. There must be a better way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, trading time for money, you can earn a good living. There's nothing wrong with it, particularly if you enjoy your work. You know, So we're not here about right, wrong, right? It's just if you want to build wealth, if you want financial independence earlier than, than old, you know, rather than just late you know, late age maturity, you know, conventional financial independence retirement. If you want to achieve something different in your life, um, you need these, these principles. When you think about leverage, uh, you talked about nine principles for mastering leverage. And uh, the first one was mathematical expectancy that you already talked about. 
And we touched on the second one, trading time for money uh, limits, or uh, uh, trading time for money limits wealth. Uh, and we talked about that briefly, too. And that's, that's what I noticed in my CPA practice. I can only grow so big unless I increase staff, which I eventually did at some point. Uh, you talk about a few other things, the opportunity cost problem. What, what is that? The opportunity cost problem is that you have limited resources. And if you, when you're stuck with your own resources, anytime you expend a resource, that's it. You can spend it one way. You can spend your time one way. Once you spend it, you don't get it back. You can spend your money one way. Once you spend it, you don't get it back. And so the idea is that you're stuck by opportunity costs. There's always an opportunity cost for everything that you do, everything that you spend on. When you go into leverage, you're using other people's resources. You're accessing resources beyond your own. And so you get beyond the opportunity cost problem. And I, I think another one of your principles, and I think this is a big one, which is uh, growing wealth by solving problems. And I think that's, in a lot of cases, if we can take a look at see, and see what some of the pain points that people have or businesses have and figure out solutions, then we can create something, as long as we're trying to think about whatever we're doing to be scalable, we can create some real wealth. Yeah, the solving problems is a key, key point in the book. And this is something that's not well understood is that if you look at every limitation to your growth, you know, particularly for entrepreneurs listening in this crowd, or you can even look at it in your job, any limitation to growth, any limitation to further achievement, if you look at it, the solution is always leverage. There's a reason it's a limitation to you. There's a reason it's an obstacle holding you back. Is it something you don't have access to, something you're not easily solving? And so the solution is always leverage. And uh, another one uh, of these nine principles is making yourself unnecessary. And that, that's an interesting concept because that's something that we kind of don't necessarily want to do. However, if you're putting these leverage principles into practice, it, it's like, well, you're going you're gonna to have to figure out how to delegate virtually everything to be scalable, which then makes you less important. Yeah, ulti ultimately, we don't want more money, right? Nobody really wants more money. What they want is what they think money will get them. And usually behind all this is this value of freedom. And so if you want, most people that they run into this conundrum, right? They either have time or they have money, but seldom do they have both. And that's where this idea comes in that you, you can't be the superhero. You can't do everything because then what happens is as you become more and more successful, you have less and less time. And we see it all the time, right? We see successful people who are running around crazy and they're not really happy. And so that's where leverage equation comes in is where you start learning how to get the freedom with your time so that as you become more successful, you actually become more free. Uh, another concept is expand the gap. What do you mean by that? Wealth is the, com as I said earlier, wealth is the compound return of both financial resources and personal, um, personal resources and financial resources. And so what you're trying to do when you expand the gap, it works two ways. Most people understand it from traditional retirement planning, which is that you save money and it's the gap between your spending and your earnings, right? So that's your savings. And so you save that money and then you multiply it out, you compound it. And so that gap of savings is then becomes assets that you compound. Well, in the advanced planning framework, which is what I'm teaching here in Leverage Equation is part of, is that it works differently because you can expand the gap geometrically in other asset classes like business and real estate because the value of the asset is a multiple of what it earns. And so if you increase the earnings or expand the gap of the asset, the equity grows geometrically. And so it's another way to really accelerate your wealth growth. Visit the show notes for this episode at yourmoneyyourwealth.com to read the transcript of this interview and to find links to Todd Tresseter's website and his new book, The Leverage Equation, How to Work Less, Make More, and Cut 30 Years Off Your Retirement Plan. I've also added links to other YMYW episodes where we've talked about the more traditional form of leverage, the financial kind. There's the episode on the risks and rewards of vacation rentals and real estate investing and the one on mobile home park investing. Check it all out in the show notes at Your Money yourwealth.com. Speaking of using financial leverage in real estate, let's hear Todd's take on it. Todd, why don't we go through some maybe examples of how to do this? How sure. do some of these principles work? All right. So let's say you buy an apartment building and let's say that it's got four units in it. Um, and yet there's this basement that could have two more units in it. And there's this beautiful attic space that if you put some dormers in it and whatever, it could have another unit. So you could take it from four to seven units. And so by doing that, you'd increase the income of the property. Well, the property is priced at a thing called NOA, net operating income. 
And so it's a multiple of that net operating income. So if you grew the property from four units to seven units, not quite double, but pretty close to it in terms of its operating income, that would multiply the value of the property. And so that's an example of like expanding that gap, the difference between the income and the, and the expenses, and then the value of the property is a multiple of that. In your book, you talk about maybe you find this really good real estate deal, and uh, but you don't have the money. But that shouldn't necessarily stop you. Yeah, I did the exact same thing in my own life, right? Except I had the money at the time, so it was actually a really stupid yeah. move on my part. <laughs> but um, I found a really good deal on a property. I had this kind of dream. I wanted to buy a large apartment building. It was 102 units. I wanted to buy it with none of my own money. It was just to see if I could do it. And so I spent a lot of time, did a lot of work. I found a large apartment building out in Oklahoma and uh, got the deal under contract. And it was a great value. Um, but it was a really complex deal. Um, it required some upgrades before we could really close on it. Uh, I'm sorry, we could close on it, but it required upgrades before we could lease it up. Had a lot of problems, but they were the right things that were wrong, right? It, there's certain things you don't want wrong with a building, but these were the right things that were wrong. And so I brought in investors and we closed on roughly about a million dollars of equity. And so I was leveraging other people's money. They were leveraging my skills, uh, my ability to put together a deal. And uh, everybody benefited. Yeah, and I think that's an example of, of one of your six types of leverage, uh, networking and relationship leverage. And, and perhaps maybe being one of the most important things is, is you, if you can draw upon some of your contacts to help fill in some of the gaps, then you can maybe create some great things. That's a key concept in the book, again, that you're hitting on, which is this idea that so many of the forms of leverage, I break them up and I categorize them, but really they cross over as you start applying it, right? So like if you look at that real estate deal example, so there was network leverage involved. I had a network of investors, people who trusted me and knew I knew what I was doing, right? I was leveraging my own knowledge to create the deal. I was leveraging my resources to locate a, a, an above, a better than market deal, they were leveraging my knowledge, my skills. I was leveraging their money. So what happens is like in a single transaction or a single situation, these forms of leverage will cross over. They will start connecting. And so it's one of the key principles I teach in the book is don't get hung up on the demarcations. They're just teaching that, you know, it's for teaching it so you can understand it and how to apply it. But when you put it in practice, what will actually happen in real time is you'll cross over these. So just find the form of leverage that you're most attracted to, that you're most capable of. So for me, example, I'm very skilled at systems leverage. It's my natural orientation. I'm not very good at networking leverage. I'm naturally shy. I'm naturally reserved, reclusive. And so I'm not as good at that. And I talk about that in the book. And so just focus on your strength and you will naturally connect over the other forms of leverage. You don't have to worry about being perfect at all of them. It works. Right. I think a lot of people that are listening are they're employed somewhere. So what might you tell them if they want to increase income or if they want to maybe take the next step? How could they apply some of the principles in this book? Yeah, there's a great example in the book on that where what you can do is you can focus on your knowledge because essentially if you're in an employment position, people are leveraging your knowledge and your skills and your time, right? You're being leveraged. And so one of the ways to expand that gap that we talked about earlier is to increase your earning capacity. And so, for example, a common question I get interviewed on is people say, if you had $1,000 to invest, Todd, what would you recommend somebody do? And I say, well, if it's your first $1,000, I say invest it in yourself and your earning capacity because that will give you the highest compound return over time. And that's how you, you expand the gap as we talked about earlier. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, let's now maybe switch gears a little bit and talk about financial leverage because it's easy to understand when it comes to real estate because you buy a million dollar property and you don't necessarily use a million dollars of your own money. Maybe you use 200000 or whatever the number is and maybe you yeah. even have a friend that helps you pay for that. You borrow the rest. So what should people think about in terms of leverage and investments? It obviously can improve your, in but it also can work the other way. Yeah. So the first rule on using financial leverage is that the asset that you're leveraging must return more than the cost of the leverage itself, right? Which is typically interest cost. So in the example of a property, it only works that the property pays more, you know, mortgage financing in this case, which is a form of financial leverage only works if the property is returning more than the cost of the leverage. Now, here's an interesting fact. A lot of people don't know. This is kind of a little off track from the book, but it's fun to apply to this example you brought in. The long-term returns on property basically track inflation. They deviate 
you know, on housing, long-term housing returns, it's plus or minus 10% from the long-term inflation track. And so what a lot of people don't understand about how wealth is built in real estate is it's done through leverage, financial leverage, right? Because what you're essentially doing is you're leveraging inflation. Let's say you have 20% down, you get five tranches of inflation, if you will, and you're only losing to inflation on the equity you put in. And then what happens is your payments get worth less and less in real terms while the value of the property grows based on inflation five times what you have in on the investment. And so it's it's pure leverage. It's leverage straight up about how you build wealth in real estate. And it works long term because inflation is not a constant, but it's prevalent ever since the Federal Reserve of 1914. And so inflation is a dominant factor and it's very consistent. And that's why real estate is a very reliable asset for building wealth. And that's why also banks are willing to lend with such low down and at the lowest interest rates. Yeah. So they're, they're, anyway, a little side note there, but it's fun to understand. Yeah. And I think just thinking about that in my own experience, because I've been a real estate investor for over 30 years. And I guess the way I explain it is if you buy a $100,000 property, which I don't know where you do, but that's just the example, <laughs> $100,000 property. And if you put $100,000 of your own money and if it goes up 5%, then you made 5% on your money. Now, if you've somehow put uh, 10,000 down, 10%, and you were able to borrow 90,000, the property still went up $5,000, but your investment was 10,000, so your rate of return is 50%. And that's actually how you make money in real estate. Now, it's not yep. that simple, because the more debt you have, the worse your cash flow. And of course, you gotta factor that, that in. But that's how folks make a lot of money in real estate, particularly like we're in, in, in California, in San Diego. We don't really have the best of cash flows here, but the appreciation over time has been pretty good. It actually uh, outpaces inflation and, and has for quite a while. But then on the other hand, when properties go down, so your $100,000 property uh, went down to 90000 so you're, in, in essence, your investment is gone. You, you lost 100% at that point. So that's why it can obviously work both ways. Yes, yeah, so you bring up a couple interesting points that are mentioned in the book. And again, this is unique to financial leverage, right? The other forms of leverage, the other five forms of leverage, you can reduce risk while increasing returns, right? But with financial leverage, it's consistent, right? It increases risk and increases return if you get it right, but if you get it wrong. So I, I said it makes the good times great and the bad times unbearable, right? But right. the interesting thing about financial leverage is mentioned in the book. So you brought up a couple points here, Alan. One is that financial leverage gives asymmetric returns. You have to subtract the interest costs from the positive return, and you have to add the interest cost to your loss, your losses magnify more than your gains multiply. Right. And so that's an important point for people to understand with financial leverage. And that's why financial leverage is the first form of leverage treated in the book. It's the one people automatically think about. It's also the one that requires the greatest caution. And so you brought up a great point about California real estate. California real estate is one of the more volatile real estate markets in the United States. One of the things about financial leverage that I taught in the book is that you don't want to apply financial leverage to volatile assets. Now, I don't know if I'd call real estate that. I'm really applying that more to businesses. Certain types of business assets are more volatile or certain types of businesses. So right, anyway, right. it's another characteristic of financial leverage where you bring in the risk management factor is where you apply financial leverage intelligently. Again, it's all taught. Let's spend just maybe a couple more minutes maybe on the other five types of leverage and how they kind of interact with each other and how to think about them. Sure. So we can talk with systems leverage as an example. One of my favorites and that's where replacing human activity with systems activity. So in my business, I'm an online education business. And so I sell courses and books, as we're talking about here, the book. And so if you look, it's almost pure systems leverage, right? So I have content marketing on the, on the website, which is leveraged through Google as a search system. That's how people find me. And then they come in and they enter funnels, right? Where I give value. That's another principle taught in the book about giving value. I give valuable information, educational resources, build relationship and trust. They come through that funnel and eventually it makes sense for them to take the next step and make a purchase. That might be a book or a course. As their education grows, they realize that this is a piece of knowledge they want to acquire. And so these are all examples of leveraging both technology and business systems. You yeah, know, that's what makes the business scalable. I mean, I can serve millions as easily as I can serve 10 people. Todd, I think that's a really good point. And I think it, it's a really good summary of, of the whole point of your book is you could mentor one person at a time, which is fine, but then you're limited in your, your own time and resources. Or you can create good systems and good content as you have. And now you can help almost an unlimited number of people. Who knew there was so much leverage out there, huh? 
Right. The thing about this book is that what I'm really trying to do is make this conscious. We're all, we all know leverage. We all understand it intuitively. What we don't understand is how to use it consciously to produce the results we want in life. And that's the key here. That's what I'm trying to communicate. Well, Todd, you're full of a lot of great information. Any other final thoughts that I forgot to ask you? A fun final thought that I left in the book, and I'll leave it with you on this interview, is that what people want to do is they want to look at their daily life, their hours, and how they spend their hours and assess how much of your time is spent pursuing high leverage activities and how much of your time is spent either wasted away or trading time for money. And that'll tell you how long it takes you to achieve your financial goals. I get that. So that's Todd Treseder, and you can find him on financialmentor.com. Todd, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Alan. We're not done with real estate just yet. Joe and Al answer some of your email questions on that very topic momentarily. Coming soon on Your Money, Your Wealth, Julia Wang from Value Penguin shares some holiday scams to look out for and how to avoid them. And Refinery29's Lindsay Stanberry talks about money diaries. Subscribe to the podcast at yourmoneyyourwealth.com so you can listen free on demand. Don't know how to subscribe? I made a video that'll walk you through it. You can find that in the show notes or on the podcast page at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. And hey, if you do get value out of this show, why not share it? Email a link to your favorite episode to your friends or post it on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Now let's get to some of those email questions. If you've got a money question, comment, or someone you'd like to hear us interview on the podcast, send an email to info at purefinancial.com or click the Ask Joe and Big Al button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Natalie from San Diego, she okay. goes, hello, uh, my brother and I have property for sale in Pacific Beach and we have an interested buyer. Um, after all said and done, um, we'll have just under 600000 in hand and want to do a 1031 exchange. Um, can I get a multifamily? I can get uh, a I can get. Oh, I yeah. can get a multifamily that has high cash flow. It's a priority for me uh, because I depend on this uh, monthly income, but I don't want to deal with um, constant hurricane damage. All right. I've been told I can get a property 10 to 15 miles inland in San Diego, upgrade it, and it will yield higher cash flow than something on the beach. I've heard, um, I have a hard time believing that if I were to take out a million dollar loan, I would get any cash, I would get any cash flow after paying off the loan and possibly upgrades. Uh, the other option I was thinking is a triple net lease, uh, but I'm aware of the risk associated with those not getting a good location, not backed by corporate, if the tenant goes bankrupt, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's, let's talk about a couple of, uh, of things. Alan, you've been a real estate investor for quite some time. Yes. And when you're looking at a property for cash flow, um, I guess one of the things that you have to look at is just what's the market value in the particular area that you're looking at? In my opinion, and my opinion is only gauged on the information that you have given me over the years. Let's see if you remembered it correctly. Yes, but San Diego is not really great for rents, rentals, because the market values are so high, and especially if you're looking to get a single-family resident or something like that, maybe a a duplex on the beach, I don't know, that's going to cost you a couple million bucks, and I don't know if the rents are going to cover that. So she's right on. She's like, you know what? I don't. I don't believe it. Right. I don't see how I got to put in more money into this thing. I got you know six hundred thousand from this. I can exchange that, buy this place, have a large note. How am I? How is this thing going to cash flow? Yeah, and I agree with that. But I will add some more tidbits. Flavor. Yes, because uh, single family homes and condos in San Diego. I'm just talking San Diego right now. Uh, they're going to have probably, in general, the, the worst cash flow of any real estate. A duplex j- tends to have a little better cash flow. Triplex even better. Fourplex even better. You get to five units and up. It's a commercial property. Now you're, sent, you're, you're, you're buying a property more based on cash flow than you are market value. And so you tend to get better cash flow on units, five units and up. Part of the reason is it's harder for people to buy because they have to get commercial loans. They have to put a lot more down payment. So, And then another factor is, and this might sound kind of weird, but the lesser the neighborhood, the, in general, the better the cash flow. So if you've got a place in Pacific Beach, you're probably not, you know, very good cash flow relative to, let's say, a place in El Cajon. And no disrespect to wow. El Cajon, but it's just that 
closer to the beach, you, you generally have lesser cash flow. Inland, you have better cash flow. Now that, so that's kind of some general things to be aware of. Now within that framework, every single property stands on its own. And you got to look at the, the neighborhood. You got to look at the financials. You got to look at, can I increase the rents if I do some little improvements? In a lot of cases uh, in San Diego, you can get a decent cash flow with units if you get a good enough deal and you put a little bit of money in and you can raise the rents and kind of turn this thing around, you know, kind of put a little bit better active management in it. It can work, but it's, it, it is a lot of work. Triple net lease? Triple net lease is, uh, I, I agree with her concerns. I mean, if, if, you're, if your triple net lease is Starbucks, you're home free because Starbucks is, they don't franchise, it's a corporate guarantee, but you don't get a very good cash flow. And in fact, I just saw a client that had a triple net lease with Starbucks in Texas, and the cash on cash was 4%. And Texas usually it's is six or eight, six or, eight or 10 even. Right. So a uh, Starbucks in San Diego would be, <laughs> I don't even know, probably two and a half. I'm just guessing. I don't, I don't really know. But yeah, I'm not a huge fan of triple net leases just because of, of it, you got one tenant. And if they leave, if they vacate, probably it's a franchise. It's, it's based upon the strength of the franchise. You might have a vacant property for a year or longer. This is Urban. It's from San Diego. Uh, Irvin's asking us, can I buy a house in the Philippines using my 401k and not t uh, pay tax on that money? Oh, that's a, that's a nice idea. Uh, the answer is no. All right, next. Well, actually, I got... <laughs> <laughs> you can take money out of your 401k, it's taxable. End of story. But I'll, I'll, I'll give... You can absolutely take money out of your 401k and buy a house in the Philippines. Yes, you can. But you but, have to pay tax on yes. it. There is a... Should I talk about the self-directed? Sure. Yeah, why not? So, Urban, if you're so inclined, you could roll, if you're allowed to, to roll your 401k to an IRA, then you would, you would have a, what's called a self-directed IRA. You can actually buy real estate inside of, a, of, of some self-directed IRAs. There are some custodians that will allow that. Could you buy a, a home in the Philippines? Potentially. But be very, very careful if you go that route because you can't you, live in you, it. You, you can't, can't visit it. You can't yeah, see it. It's, you, you can't, can't really touch have it. it. And it's a it's a rental, right? It's an investment. You, you yeah, can't you can't even drive by it. You can drive by it, but you, I you, don't think so. You can't even go and fix it up yourself. You have to hire people. You can't. You certainly can't use it yourself. And if if you want any relatives in there, I, I would not do that. So yeah. I I don't think that's the way you want to go. So uh, good news, Irvin. You have money in your four hundred one k plan. Yep, and you can withdraw it. You will pay taxes, and you can buy a property in the Philippines, but you can't. You cannot get out of paying taxes. Yes, <clears throat> we get that a lot. Yeah, I think because it, we've seen these mistakes a lot. Sure, right? It's like, all right, well, here I have this four hundred one k, which is an investment, and I want to buy another investment. Why, why can't I just take the money from this investment and buy this investment? Right. Well. It just doesn't work. Yeah, that way. if yeah, once you take it out of the shell of a retirement account, it's taxable. All right, we got. Let's see, Alice uh, from San Diego. I have a Roth IRA. It will be seventy-one in February, twenty nineteen. Am I required to take a required amount of money out every month, Alice? Uh, with a Roth IRA. There is no required minimum distribution, so you do not have to take any money out of that account if you choose not to. Where if you have a traditional IRA or a 401k, that is where the required minimum distributions come into play. So Roth IRAs are exempt from RMDs, so hopefully that made your day. Yeah, and I'll just add, so if you have a regular traditional IRA, uh, you, you, you just have to take out the I RMD, required minimum distribution amount, by year end. Or you could take it out monthly. Or you, you could, could do it monthly, but you don't have to. Sure. Yeah, now if you... How do you take your RMDs? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's decades off. <laughs> I will say one one little caveat, though, Alice, is uh, uh, when at some point when you pass away and whoever gets the uh, Roth IRA, if they're not your spouse, they'll have to take a required minimum distribution on an inherited, non-spousal inherited Roth IRA, but you don't have to take a, a required distribution. Um, all right. Maria from San Diego. I just turned 70, and a friend told me I could start taking... 
RMDs now. Now. <laughs> I, I, I pre-read it because it was a typo. I, I, didn't to... I was going to read nor. <laughs> <laughs> thought I'd help you out. Oh, thank you. Now, or in, or in January. <laughs> As you can tell, I don't pre-read these. <laughs> Because if if he would have read it, it would have. I I just turned seventy, and a friend told me I could start taking RMD Nor or in January. <laughs> yeah, uh, Nor sounds good to me. <laughs> I think it's now. <laughs> Got it. And then another one in twenty twenty uh, to minimize the impact of taxes this is true. When is the best time to start RMDs to lower tax impact? Thank you, Maria. What say you, Big Al? So she just turned 70. Just turned 70, so we're in 2018. So I'm going to assume by just turning 70, you'll be probably 70 and a half next year in, in 2019. 2019. Yep. So you don't really have to take your first RMD until 2019, actually 2020 to be exact, that your required beginning date would be April 1st of 2020. You agree with me so far? I do. Okay. However, if you wait till 2020, you're going to have to take two RMDs. Uh, one for 2019, one for 2020. So if you're trying not to pile up too much income in one year, take one required minimum distribution in 2019 and one in 2020 and then keep on going. Yep. So your friend um, was accurate. But what is the, what, what's the best time to start RMDs to lower tax impact? Well, I think if you're 70 now, Maria, um, you might want to look at how much income do you have? You might want to start bleeding some of these dollars out this year as well, before the end of the year. Depending upon your tax bracket. Yes, yeah. because we have very low tax brackets right now. Let's say if you're in the 12% tax bracket, you know, I don't know, maybe you fill up that 12% tax bracket. So you would want to take a distribution from that. Maybe you convert that into a Roth IRA. So you can still stay in a very low tax bracket. That money's out of the IRA. Now it's in a Roth IRA. There is no required minimum distribution on Roth. So next year, when you take your RMD, it's going to be lower because you got more money out of the retirement account this year. Right. So Completely agree. Uh, so a little bit extra planning there for Maria. I'll so, just say, uh, that's right, Joe. Hey, that's right, Al. <laughs> you are correct, sir. <laughs> Videos of Joe and Al answering these emails are, you guessed it, in the show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com, along with links to free resources on how to get started in investing in real estate and buying real estate in your IRA. By the way, if you haven't noticed, the end of the year is upon us already. Surprise! Make sure you check out this week's episode of the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show on year-end tax planning strategies while there's still time. Watch it online at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click special offer to download the 2018 tax planning checklist for free. Like I just drink like this monster? Yeah, it's little... really syrupy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Got so, it. It's probably not... Very good for uh, radio. Well, I'm sitting here drinking uh, Earl Grey tea. Ooh, is that a beer? No. Is that a it's, beer? It's a, it's a cultured person's drink. Oh. <laughs> you know, all these IPAs have these weird names now. I do know that. You know? Did I tell you about my spotted cow? Uh, no. Have you ever heard of it? It's New Glarus, Wisconsin. No. I was in Minnesota over the holiday weekend, right? right? Thanksgiving. I do know that. And my cousin lives in Wisconsin. He actually lives in New Glarus. Right. And he brought me um, a few spotted cows. Yeah. So I'm usually a, just a Blue Mountain kind of guy. Yeah. So, but how how they taste? Not bad. Well, yeah. Okay. You know, when you're freezing. <laughs> Anything so this is an good. IPA? I don't know what it is. No, it's not I, an IPA because he gets headaches with IPAs. Yeah. It was. It was something yeah, like. See, I'm thinking like his his it, buddy it, from Wisconsin brought him an actual cow. N- no, well, <laughs> no. It's uh, well, that could be. That, but, yeah, he could have done that too. <laughs> and maybe thought about it. <laughs> yeah. but, so I went uh, actually last night. I went to Ballast Point with my brother Todd. Mm. So they do have good IPAs there. Yeah, I'm not a big fan. But you have to drink. You have to drink in moderation because you do get headaches, or at least I do. If if I have too many, <laughs> as you know from seeing me do this before. <laughs> Oh, uh, what a week we've had. Yes. Are you going to give us some highlights? I can. I can give you a few um, high points. Okay. But I'm not an economist by any stretch of the imagination here. 
No one was guessing that you were. Really, I thought yeah. most people were. They tune <laughs> in for this pretty, market update. Pretty sure they know that. So what the hell did happen? Was it what is it? Trump with the tariffs and then the non-tariffs? It's a truce, but not a truce. Well, it looked like the there was an agreement, and then it's like, well, no, it's not going to happen fast. It's like, well, what, what does that mean? The market shoots way up, and then it goes way down. Yeah. So. We is, had a little that, bit. Is that your yeah, analysis? That's, it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's next. Best you got. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about the inverted yield curve. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> uh, what do you got there? I don't know. I need Brian Perry's help for this one. <laughs> but that is a trigger in some yeah. cases. That's right. what some people say. But some people disagree. What is an inverted yield curve? Well. <laughs> I can explain it. I don't really know how it happens because it's it's somewhat illogical to me. Right. Because if I look at risk in return, right, there's they're supposed to be related in some degree. Yeah. The more risk I'm willing to take, I should anticipate a higher expected rate of return. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So now we're talking about bonds, fixed income. So let's say if I have a short term bond, a bond is a loan. Right. And so if I say, Alan, I will lend you money for thirty days. Versus 30 years, right. the 30 day loan is a lot less risky for me versus giving you money for 30 years. Yeah, that's true. Does that seem logical to you? Yeah, because I don't know if you're going to be around in 30 right. years. So if I'm giving money, loaning money out to a corporation, a government, or something like that, and if it's a short term loan, then I'm saying, okay, well, here, I know that I'm going to get my money back. I'm looking at your balance sheet. And yeah, I feel pretty you, good yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, you have cash flow. You just right. need a short term fix. Okay, I will lend you the money for one year, two year, three years. But I'm not going to ask you for a huge interest rate because there's not that much risk. But I do need a little bit for you know for the use of my capital. Yeah, and of course that's that's if it's a, they're a strong company, strong lender. Right? Exactly. So if I'm lending that money out longer, well then hey, I need a little bit more return because I'm giving you my capital for a longer period of time. So I'm taking on more risk, and I should anticipate a higher expected rate of return. Right, and so, that, so that's if, a normal yield curve. So if you look at a yield curve, right, short term. Your interest rates are, are low. lower, and as you go longer, yeah. the yield that you're receiving from those loans should go up. Okay. That's a curve, and it's curving up. And that's that's a kind of a normal curve. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what the, the smart people call it. We are, <laughs> we're right into a normal curve. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we expect. An inverted yield curve is the opposite. So... So high, higher interest rates for short term, lower for long term. Well, it, it, it doesn't really invert that much. Yeah. But it's almost like flat, right? If I look at the ten year Treasury versus the twenty, you know, they're they're very similar. Got it. Uh, can I explain why? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have no clue. And I can't either. But that's that's why we need Brian Perry. In here. <laughs> yes. But I know the definition of it. Right. But but, but, um, what, but what is does it does it mean what does it mean? I mean, no one really cares what it is. What's it mean to you and your investing? Well, th- th- you're 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 getting the same rate of return for a longer term note than you are for a shorter term note. Yeah. So why go longer term? Why go longer term in that particular case? Right. But I think it has a lot to do with a lot more than individual investors. It's corporations. It's big money. It's pensions. It's, it's endowments. Kind of, it's, it's potentially the future. It's of yes, the market. exactly. Yeah. So it's forward looking within the overall markets. And you know, let's say if I'm an endowment or Kelpers or Kelsters, I buy certain bonds because I have certain liabilities at certain time frames. So a lot of these big institutions buy these bonds because they have certain liabilities at certain times where those coupons are going to come up or that bond is come due, so they can fulfill those liabilities. Right. Um, th- yeah, that's way over my head. <laughs> I'm not a bond trader. I wasn't even listening, so I don't care. <laughs> but wait, isn't the concern the fact that the inverted yield curve has something to do with its signal the recessions in yes, the past? Yes, that's, yes, yes. It's a trigger. It's a signal. Concern? Yes. That's, but that's... some econ- uh, economist, I was going to say economists. <laughs> 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 Them too. <laughs> yeah, those guys too. Th- they're like, yeah, well... After the fact, sometimes, but it's not all the time, and it's like maybe forty percent of the time. So it's it's hard to say. It, it's a signal, but it's not necessarily it's not guaranteed. a fact. Yeah. So in other words, don't worry. Yes. Okay. There well, we're not saying that. <laughs> I'm, well, Do you worry. Know what I, I'm, I'm worried about everything you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, mm-hmm. I can um, moving on. <laughs> Did you hear about uh, friends? Friends. No. And uh, Netflix? No. What happened? Do you like Friends? I do. It's actually one of my favorite shows. Okay. Yeah. So 
you can stream f- uh, Friends on Netflix. Yes, I do know that. Okay. And then did you see the sign? Do you, when's the last time you saw an episode? Uh, probably like a week ago. All right. Because so, w- like when there's nothing on, I flip the channels and there's a Friends episode. I got good enough. Oh, I mean, are you watching Friends on TBS or are you watching it on Netflix? Uh, on TBS because I don't normally watch it. Just if, if, I, uh, if I happen to be – like I hardly ever watch regular TV because now there is Netflix right. and, and there's DVR. HBO so, to go. So, and- so why would I – but I guess if I'm in a hotel and, there's, and I want to watch something and there's, I, I'm sort of limited. So, so, so anyway, Netflix it has this um, agreement with AT&T to stream – Right. Um, friends, right. because they're the owner of the the the, the rights. Got it. Friends. Okay. And so they were going to stop uh, showing Friends. Really? And everyone went crazy, I guess, yeah. over the past couple of weeks. Right. They were like, the only reason why I have Netflix is because of yeah, Friends. Yeah, so I'm getting out of it. Yeah, so like 80 million bucks they're going to pay just to continue to stream. No kidding. 80 okay. to 100 million. Wow. Something like that. Yeah. And we got we actually have the box set oh, for yeah. Friends. That was before Netflix. <laughs> yeah, so do I. <laughs> That's <laughs> I'll sell that for eighty billion. <laughs> you can watch it anytime you want. I will, you want. <laughs> and I will bring, I'll bring set up my your DVD, DVD bring, player. Yes, I'll bring my DVD player, <laughs> and we will. Uh, and it's streaming forever. <laughs> Until your discs get scratched up and it doesn't anytime. work. Anytime, you know, anytime you want. That's it for us today. I want to thank our lovely producer Andy Last, thank you. Big Al Clopine. I'm Joe Anderson, and we'll see you next week. Special thanks to today's guest, Todd Tresseter. Learn more about the leverage equation at Todd's website, financialmentor.com. To subscribe to the Your Money, Your Wealth podcast newsletter or subscribe to the podcast on your desktop computer or your favorite mobile app, or to learn how to subscribe, visit the show notes for this episode at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Email your money questions to info at purefinancial.com or call 888-994-6257. Listen next time for more Your Money, Your Wealth presented by Pure Financial Advisors. For your free financial assessment, visit purefinancial.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Mary Mary.